Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There are a fair amount of shorthand names for Epis Episcopalians out there, many of which I'm not actually a huge fan of, to be honest. <laughs> One of my least favorite is when people say, oh yes, the Episcopal Church, that's like Catholic light. Speaking for myself, having found a profoundly deep spirituality in this tradition, a very serious approach to scripture, and a rigorous engagement with theology, I think of our church as Catholic deep, not, <laughs> not Catholic light. That may be just me, but I'm just a son. Then there are those who refer to us, of course, as whiskey pallians. <laughs> an acknowledgement of our generally more open approach to the consumption of alcoholic beverages than more conservative Christian traditions. And though I do admittedly enjoy a fine glass of whiskey, that term also makes light of the reality that our church has sometimes been complicit in people's struggle with addiction and alcohol. It makes light of it. It doesn't it also doesn't recognize that many of the key founders of Alcoholics Anonymous were actually Episcopalians. Twelve-step spirituality comes straight out of Anglicanism's broad and expansive understanding of the divine, along with our belief in God and our higher power's ability to change us, not just forgive us, but to change us. One of the terms you don't hear very much anymore, but that was fairly common in the 20th century, was that the Episcopalians were the frozen chosen. <laughs> and indeed, frozen chosen was used to describe many different mainline Protestant traditions, from Episcopalians to Presbyterian to Lutheran, basically any church that looked askew at more enthusiastic approaches to the practice of the Christian faith. God save us from enthusiasm. <laughs> the phrase speaks to the reality that our tradition has a more rational and sometimes non-emotional approach to religion. And while I clearly have no problem with emotion in religion myself, I will admit that when I go to our monthly local pastor's prayer gathering and we spend 30 or 45 minutes in spontaneous worship and prayer, by the end of it, I have a desire to be a bit more frozen. <laughs> Whether or not we see ourselves as the frozen chosen makes today's gospel reading a bit more interesting. Jesus goes up to Jerusalem, discovers people selling sacrificial animals and exchanging money in the temple. He makes a whip of cords and drives them out of the temple, overturning tables, pouring out coins, telling people to stop making his father's house a marketplace. Now this is clearly not frozen chosen behavior. One wonders if Jesus consulted with the temple leadership in advance to ensure that a team of volunteers were set up to clean up <laughs> after his exuberant display. Perhaps it was put on the temple information table. Because if no one cleans up after this, the sexton is absolutely going to complain to the parish, I mean temple administrator, who will likely complain to the rector who will simply roll his eyes saying, what do you want me to do with these people? Yeah. <laughs> it's also possible, though, that some of us read this gospel and we get rather excited at this side of Jesus. I mean, if we were hanging out with Christ and he said he wanted to make a whip of cords and drive out the forces of injustice, we'd be tying our own whips right behind him. I'm right after you, man. I've been waiting my whole life for this. <laughs> after all, we all have some people in the world whose tables we'd like to flip over, if we're honest. <laughs> and Jesus seems to be giving us permission to do that, to ride out in the cause of justice, to set the world right according to our understanding of what we think the world should be. And so we probably would do well to be reminded that the condemnation Jesus serves up is not for the easy villains of first century Jewish religion. Though the temple system in the first century was not perfect, no religious system is, it was not a wholly cynical or wicked enterprise. 
In the end, they needed a place to exchange money, to exchange money that had a graven image on it for money without, so that they could pay the temple tax. They needed a place for people to buy clean animals to be used in sacrifice, knowing few people could make the trip with the animals from home and keep them ritually clean the whole way. So over time, they set this all up in the court of the Gentiles, likely reasoning that the Gentiles were already unclean. What harm could a few animals and coins do to make it much worse? It was a comfortable choice to meet some very reasonable institutional goals. And likely they'd become blind to the impact of what they were doing. When this story shows up in the Gospel of Matthew, it seems to be that the problem is some kind of corruption or price gouging that's going on. As Jesus says, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've turned it into a den of robbers? In the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus is drawing from other prophetic figures, particularly from Isaiah and Jeremiah. But that's not the language Jesus uses in our gospel for today. He says nothing about a den of robbers. In John's gospel, he simply says, stop making my father's house a marketplace, indicating that it's the very activity of buying and selling in the temple that he is rejecting. But why? You see, in John's gospel, Jesus is actually quoting from the prophet Zechariah, not Isaiah or Jeremiah, Zechariah specifically, he's quoting from chapter 14. In this chapter, Zechariah imagines the latter day, the day when God's desire for the world is fulfilled and the Messiah finally arrives. In that latter day, all nations will come to the temple in Zechariah's dream. They'll keep one of the ancient Jewish festivals, the festival of booths, otherwise known as the festival of tents or tabernacles. Everything at that time, Zechariah believes, will become sacred to the Lord. And Zechariah closes the chapter by saying, And there shall no longer be traitors in the house of the Lord, in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. So by telling the people who are trading, the traitors, to leave, that the house of God is not a marketplace, but is a place for all nations, Jesus is making it clear that Zechariah's dream has come true. That the Lord has come in him. And that the barriers to worship by the Gentiles, the nations, all those who are not a part of the chosen people, that those barriers must now be taken out of the temple so that all nations, all people can finally worship. I mean, we might want to make a whip of cords and charge behind Jesus, but as one scholar pointed out, we can never settle for an image of Jesus with a whip who criticizes someone else rather than us. Because if we read this text as Jesus getting after those we don't like, driving out the injustice that only offends us, then we have missed the heart of this text from John's Gospel. But if instead... We see Jesus here ensuring that there is a place for all people to worship, that all barriers must be taken out, including the barriers you and I might place so that we can be comfortable in our worship, so that we aren't asked too much. Well, then that whip of cords begin to, begins to turn uncomfortably in our direction as Jesus begins to call us to repentance, to ask what barriers we've been putting up to keep others from finding what we've found in God? Or what have we been holding back so that the welcome could be made more abundantly and extravagantly? When Jesus' disciples saw all of this happen, we're told that they remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. And as we've now learned, this does not mean a zeal with which we fashion our own rip, whip of cords to drive out those with whom we disagree. It means a zeal which literally consumed Jesus, consumed his very body until he hung dead on the cross. A zeal for all people being welcomed in God's kingdom no matter the cost. When the Jewish leaders confront Jesus, asking him for a sign, <clears throat> 
Jesus tells them, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Did you catch that? Jesus is saying, if anyone's destroying the temple, it's them. It's them that are destroying what this was supposed to be about. Destroy this temple, he says, go ahead. But in three days I'll raise it up. And he's also, of course, referring to how their rejection will lead to the destruction of his own body. But how in three days God will raise him from the dead and that Christ will become a new temple. The body of Christ will become the church, a place where all people can find home. It sort of makes me ask if, if during this season of Lent, you and I can turn from the easier sorts of zeal, the zeal against those with whom we disagree, and turn instead towards cultivating a zeal for God's loving, way, loving reign, a zeal that won't wound others with our anger, but a zeal which might wind up consuming us with God's love, just as Jesus was consumed. As I ponder that sort of zeal, I'm reminded of one of the seminarians in the history of the Episcopal Church, Jonathan Myrick Daniels, a young man who went down to march with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King during the Civil Rights Movement. Daniels found himself arrested with several other protesters, and after they were all released the next day, they went to a grocery store to pick up a few things, a few items. And as they were coming out of the store, a part-time sheriff's deputy put, pulled out a shotgun and pointed it at a young black girl, Ruby Sales. That young Episcopal seminarian stepped right in front of Ruby, took the full blast of the shotgun. He died instantly and is now recognized as a martyr of our church. The man who murdered Jonathan Myrick Daniels was acquitted on all charges by an all-white jury. I think in a lot of ways that was a galvanizing moment for our church. It was when we realized that we couldn't just be the frozen chosen when this is what's happening in the world particularly when one of our own has demonstrated so clearly what it actually means to be a follower of Jesus. It made it clear that if our church simply sat on the sidelines and refused to engage in the unrest that our country was facing, that all it would result would be the deaths of more marginalized people. Well, we sat comfortable in our pretty churches. We realized we needed to put our privilege on the line even if it would upset people. We needed to step out of the church building and into the shotgun blast of those seeking to do harm, no matter the cost. That was the sort of zeal we needed then, a zeal that didn't result in us being more comfortable, a zeal that also marks around the time the membership of our church started declining. A zeal which consumes. A zeal that involves taking risks and sacrifices, giving up our comfort for the sake of what God's kingdom needs. I wonder, I wonder if we can cultivate that kind of zeal today in our own time. So what kind of zeal will you choose this Lent? The zeal for yourself, your own life, your comfort. Or a zeal for God's love, even if it might consume you. Even if it might cost you. Because one of those types of zeal is the sort of zeal that led to religious people crucifying God because he made them a bit too uncomfortable. But the other zeal. The zeal that consumes us, this is the zeal that shakes the church reforming her ever closer to God's call, God's vision of beloved community. Amen.